Uh, Susan, thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be back in sunny Southern California. Uh, good of you to turn out on a, on a night like this. Uh, and uh, I should uh, say right at the outset that uh, what I'm going to do is to talk for about 20 minutes or so, uh, and then we can have uh, informal discussion, question and answer, uh, whichever way you want to play it. So uh, just let me know. Uh, now, the question of whether or not we are alone in the universe is one of the oldest that human beings have ever asked. It goes back to the dawn of human history. But for most of that time, it was in the province of religion and philosophy. But 50 years ago, this month, it became part of science. And it uh, began when a then little-known astronomer by the name of Frank Drake uh, decided to use a radio telescope to scour the skies in the hope of picking up, picking up a message from ET. And at the time, it seemed a rather quixotic quest, but over the years, it's grown and grown uh, so that now uh, this subject, which is known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is an international effort that involves some of the world's largest radio telescopes. Now, this wasn't an idle uh, activity by Frank 50 years ago. Uh, it was based on some sound thinking that it was realized in the 1950s that the then new radio telescopes, big dishes uh, were incredibly sensitive, they could be built to an enormous size, and they had the capability of communicating not just across terrestrial distances, but interstellar distances. And so it, it's all in the arithmetic. A radio telescope really could beam a message to another star, to another civilization. And so then the question is, is anybody beaming a message our way? And that was what Frank Drake set out to, uh, to find out. Now, the book title says it all, The Eerie Silence. After 50 years of heroic effort, Frank and his colleagues have heard only the uh, clatter and hiss of radio static coming from space. They haven't yet got that all-important message. And so I wanted to write a book that was, first of all, congratulating them on 50 years of effort, but also uh, a critique. Maybe we're looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. That eerie silence, does it mean we really are alone in the universe, or should we be doing something different? And so if you talk to them, they say, well, give us a chance, it's only been 50 years. Uh, though I have to hand it to Frank, uh, he's still in the game, 50 years on. He's now in his late 70s, and he's still an active SETI astronomer. Not many people who could de design an experiment, run it for 50 years, get a null result, and still be upbeat about the future. <laughs> and so he must be described as a SETI optimist. But there's a fundamental problem with the basic scenario, which is uh, that ET is sending us a message. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, is it credible? Well, it's certainly credible that there can be civilizations out there with the capability uh, and maybe even the motivation uh, to signal across the galaxy. Earth is about four and a half billion years old. The galaxy is much older, about 13 billion years. There were stars and planets around long before Earth even existed. So if it's the case that life forms readily on Earth-like planets, and if there are lots of Earth-like planets out there, and if intelligence is something that will evolve, given enough time, then there could have been civilizations with advanced technology around before Earth even existed. So there's been plenty of time uh, for a sort of galactic internet to become uh, established. That's the underlying philosophy, <coughs> but, and there's a big caveat, uh, for ET to be beaming messages our way, for us to pick them up now, uh, we have to ask how far away is this civilization likely to be? Now, of course, we haven't a clue. At this particular time, we have no evidence whatsoever that there's any life beyond Earth, let alone intelligent life. Uh, but let's go to a SETI optimist, Frank Drake, and ask, uh, how many civilizations do you think are out there in the galaxy at this time transmitting radio messages? And he comes up with a number, 10,000. Well, that's great. Uh, it's only uh, a complete guesswork, of course. Uh, but he uh, picks 10,000. So we can say, well, um, how near is the nearest civilization likely to be? And it comes out around about a thousand light years. Why don't you come to these chairs over here? Unless you, you want to be next to each other. So a thousand light years is a, is a ballpark figure. Uh, now, uh, nothing uh, travels faster than light. So if you live a thousand light years away from Earth, you see Earth today as it was a thousand years ago. 
And there were no radio telescopes at that time. So put yourself in the position of a SETI enthusiast uh, on this hypothetical civilization a thousand light years away, going to your uh, grant uh, funding agency and saying, we've been studying an interesting planet over there, call it Earth, uh, and we're convinced that there is intelligent life on Earth because we can see uh, the pyramids and the Great Wall of China. And we think that any millennium soon, they will have radio telescope technology. Uh, can we have some money to start transmitting messages? And I know I can tell you exactly what the answer is going to be. Great idea. We love it. Come back in a few thousand years when you know they're on the air. Uh, and when will they know that? Well, when our first radio messages reach them in about another 900 years. So you can see what we're up against, that the idea of searching for deliberately beamed messages, messages directed at Earth by a civilization that wants to say, hi guys, have I got news for you? beaming directly to us uh, just isn't really credible. There's no reason why they should start transmitting till they, to us deliberately, till they know that we can uh, pick up their signals. Now, of course, they might be transmitting to each other. It's conceivable we could stumble across a message intended for somebody else coming from over there and intended for somebody over there, and we're just in the way. But that's a bit of a long shot. So uh, one of the problems with the traditional approach to SETI, I think, is uh, that it, it dwells on looking for deliberately directed so-called narrow-band uh, radio signals. But uh, we can uh, think of other things. So what I wanted to do in this book was, it's like a wake-up call to the entire scientific community, saying, let's not leave it to a small band of radio astronomers to search for ET. Let's look for ET in as many imaginative ways that we can think of. Now, sticking with the radio telescopes for a moment, uh, we could look for beacons, for example. A beacon is a different sort of thing. It's not a message where you would expect to get a reply. Imagine being a lighthouse keeper. Uh, you know that that light is going to sweep around and go and flash uh, for somebody who's out there, but you don't expect a reply to it. It's a, it's a one-way thing. It's a greeting or a warning or something like that. There could be beacons in the galaxy, uh, but to look for a beacon, you've got to look at the same bit of sky for a long period of time. Just like you have to stare at where you, you see the lighthouse, you see it flash and you keep looking, it flashes again, you know somebody's trying to attract your attention. Uh, the SETI uh, project is not well geared up for that. Uh, they tend to uh, turn a radio telescope on a nearby star and listen in for half an hour or something and then go to another one. And they have a target list. Uh, but the idea of, um, of just staring, say, straight at the centre of the galaxy for months or years on end uh, is not something they're funded to do. Uh, but I think that we should uh, try to enlarge the search to, to do such things. Um, but really, we, uh, once you get away from the idea that we're looking for a message for us, uh, we just uh, go to the idea of um, all we want to do is answer the question, are we alone in the universe? Uh, then we could look for any signature of alien technology, even inadvertent signatures. It doesn't have to be a calling card or a deliberate message. It could be uh, any footprint that a technological society would leave on its environment. So, for example, human technological society is leaving a footprint. It's called global warming. It could be detected from a long way away. Presumably a civilization that's been around for millions, tens of millions, who knows, even hundreds of millions of years, would have a much bigger footprint uh, and would extend beyond its home planet to its immediate astronomical environment. So there's things that we could look for, and in the book I suggest I'm not going to start listing them all now. I suggest what those things uh, might be. Now, there's one factor uh, that dominates all of this, and there's an entire chapter of the book devoted to it. And this is where I think we can make real progress in the next few years. That the entire SETI enterprise is predicated on the notion uh, that life is abundant and intelligence will evolve once life gets started, here and there at least. Uh, now, why do we think that life is abundant? 